John the Baptist, that he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. When I was a freshman in high school, my dad showed me one of my favorite movies of all time, in my opinion, one of the greatest movies of all time, Pat. Right? George C. Scott. And that opening scene is one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history, right? You have the, the big American flag, and there stands Patton with all of his medals and his ribbons, and he's got the four-star helmets and everything. He's got the, the ivory, right? Not pearl, but ivory-handled, you know, gun. He's got the whip and everything. It's just awesome looking. The music stops, and Patton goes into this opening address, which is actually what it is is not one speech he ever gave this way. It's just a bunch of stuff he said that they made into one speech. So it's fun times. But you know, he begins by saying, Americans love winners, right? That you like the champion marble shooter, the fastest runner, the best baseball player, the toughest boxers, that Americans hate to lose. They won't even tolerate a loser. Remember, he says, I wouldn't get a Putin H-E double hockey sticks for a man who lost and laughed about it. Americans hate losing. The idea of losing, like he says, is just hateful. We don't like losing. None of us like being the last person. I mean, really, you think of it like as if you're one amongst other siblings, you don't take joy in being the least favorite child, do you? Does anyone do jumping jacks when they got picked last for dodgeball in elementary school? No one enters a race thinking, man, I hope I come in dead last. Right? No one enters a pie in the baking competition hoping the judge spits it out because it tastes so terrible. We don't like to be the least. We don't like to lose. We don't like to be ignored. We don't like to be kind of just there. Now, maybe in certain areas we do. Like, when we come to church, we may not want to be the center stage. But all of us have that one place where we want to be the most known, the center of attention, the best at something. We all have this. We grasp to be at the top. We want people to talk about us, to know us. When they say, well, who's the best at that? Well, you got to go see that guy or girl. Woman, most I say, girl, woman, I don't know, one of them. But safe to say, none of us desire to be the least. We don't want others to be appreciated, especially those people we don't like, more than we do. Remember the words... St. Paul to the Philippians. I don't know why this wasn't the epistle reading. I, I mean, I guess I get by 1 Corinthians, so I'll get back in my DeLorean and go back to the lectionary guy and say, why didn't we choose Philippians 2 instead? Remember, Paul says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility <coughs> count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you not look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. My friends, you were baptized into Christ. You are children of paradise. You don't get to be the center of attention. You don't get to be the best at something. You are like Christ. You are the least. You put others ahead of yourself. You think of others. You focus on others. And when I say others, I don't just mean family members. I mean everyone. But who among you does this? Perfect. Unconditionally as your Lord and Savior Jesus. I know I... I know I should be, not just when thinking of others, but also of myself, that I should think the least of my own works, 
of my own righteousness, of my own opinions. That's the lovely part. Remember a couple Sundays ago I said there's no such thing as righteous anger? And the pastor just corrected me and I said, yes, you're right. Or the man says there is, but no one lives in their vocation with anger. The reality is why you get angry is because you think you're entitled to be better than someone else. When you actually have utter despair that you are, without a doubt, the worst person on God's green earth, then you're never mad at anybody. Because who's the worst person? Me. It's not anybody else. I am the least in the kingdom of heaven. I am the worst of sin. I am at the bottom. No one can sink lower than me. It is to that person that our Lord Christ come. For Christ did not come to heal the well, for the healthy are in no need of a physician, but instead Christ came heal the sick. He came not for the righteous but for sinners. I, I get Luther sanctioned all of a sudden. I'm like the Pope. Why not? Can't he be a saint? I mean, Luther's basically a saint, right? Saint Dr. Martin Luther, of blessed holy memory, once said, Christ came to save sinners, so you best be one. Not meaning go do whatever you want, but meaning confess who you are. Acknowledge who you have. Acknowledge the necessity for Christ. For he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the goat. He who is least is greater than he. For your Lord Christ came to save you who are the least, you who are the worst. You who know your depravity and know your failure, who know your weaknesses, and cry out, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. When you cry over your transgression, when you mourn, when you have that feeling in your gut that you, you know what you've done is wrong, it's like drinking too much the night before. Oh, I know, I've done it before. I'm sure you all done it sometime in your life. I never touched that stuff, Pastor. Right. <clears throat> have fun explaining that one on the last day. But you had too much the night before. You forget what you did. You made a fool of yourself. How do you feel the next morning when you made a fool of yourself? How do you look at people? You're like this, aren't you? Don't look at me. I can't believe I did that. that that's who Christ came to say. The ones who say, don't look at me. I can't believe I did that. Christ comes doesn't condemn, but takes what makes you a fool. He takes what embarrasses you. He takes what imprisons you to the power of the devil. He takes what consumes you, what guilts you, what burdens you, what dis depresses you, what brings you into a despair, not a, a worldly despair as if there's no hope, but a godly despair, of despairing of self, knowing that there's nothing good in you. He takes what isn't good. Because he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself so that he may fill himself up with your sin. He filled himself up with your failure, with your mistakes, with your wish I would have and wish I had. What do I say all the time? Oh, I, the reason I say things all the time is not because I don't have new material. It's because I hope you remember it. There isn't one sin that Jesus didn't die for on the cross for you. There's not one thing that Jesus did not make atonement for. On the cross, your Lord Christ emptied himself that he may be filled up with all that good can do. So that the poor may have good news preached. So that now, Pastor Daniels and I, 
may come to you and preach the good news, the great news, the news that you need to hear, that you are not condemned, because Christ has the authority to condemn you, but he doesn't do it. Instead, he forgives you. He absolves you. He acquits you. He takes all the debt you owe, and he assumes it as his own, and stands before his Father and says, I am free. They are free to enter into paradise. You, my friends, are free from the debt you owe to the Father. There's nothing you owe to when Christ has paid it all for you. You are forgiven. You who have nothing to show the Father, who are least, are now the greatest in heaven because of Christ. For not only did He empty Himself out to receive all of your sin, He emptied Himself out that you may receive all of His righteousness all of His holiness, all of His life, so that now you live that holy life, because that's what you and I do. We strive to be the least, right? We strive to be good. We strive to be sacrificial. We strive to be loving. I mean, this is a hard time of the year, right? It's a stressful time of the year. Why is it stressful? Because you want to get that, that perfect gift for somebody. You want to have that perfect holiday for someone. You want to be there for someone, and how does it go for you? You pull a Clark Griswold. You fail at it, right? You bomb. Each week you bomb. You fail. You try hard. You leave church pumped. I'm going to do it. I'm going to put others before myself. I'm going to repent of my sin. I'm going to do it. And then what do we do? Fail. My friends, that is why the good news is for you. The good news is you don't save yourself. The good news is, you're not going to heaven because you're the greatest. John the Baptist is not dwelling in heaven because he was the greatest born of woman. John the Baptist is in heaven because his Lord Christ assumed all of his sin and died for him on the cross, rose from the dead for him that he may live eternally. And it is the same for you. My friends, this is what gives us joy. This is our Gaudetest Sunday, our Rejoice Sunday, that in Christ, in our forgiveness, we have joy that cannot be taken away. Joy that is abundant. Joy that can never be too full in this life, but will be filled in the life to come. So my friends, be at peace and take heart, no matter the struggles you have in this life. <coughs> yes, you are the least. Christ became the least for you. That in the life to come, you will be the greatest, sitting with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Take heart, my friends. We have joy because of what Christ has done for us. Hallelujah, Christ is risen.